What's up everyone? My name is Tony Burke. I am an AFF rated instructor as well as SNTA. I'm also a private pilot, FAA senior rigger, and canopy coach. And today we're going to talk about choosing your first AED. Or maybe it's not your first AED, maybe you need to get another AED because your AED is expiring. But we're going to talk about AEDs in terms of equipment. So this is part of a series of gear guide videos that I'm doing talking about how to make informed gear decisions. So this guide is for the newly licensed skydiver or about to be licensed skydiver or maybe you're a skydiver who needs to purchase a new AAD because your old AAD is either expired or about to expire and you need to make a new purchasing decision. So this guide is meant to help you make that decision on an informed basis. So if you're new to skydiving, you know you need a rig. And your rig is going to be comprised of four primary components. We have the main canopy, we have the reserve canopy, we have the AAD, and we have the container that houses the three other components. This video is just going to concentrate on the AAD portion. I will have other videos coming out which talk about how to select a main canopy, a reserve canopy, and a container. But first, since we're talking about skydiving, I think I should make a few disclaimers. First, number one, skydiving is a dangerous sport and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It has been said, and this is something that I agree with, is that skydiving is a dangerous sport that can be done safely, and I agree with that. But your safety is largely in your own hands. Remember, you're jumping at your own risk and take responsibility for your own safety. This guide is not meant to replace the wisdom and experience of your local riggers and instructors. If anything that I say contradicts anything that they say, I would defer to them, especially since they know you better than I do. This guide is meant to help you select an appropriate AAD or automatic activation device. This is a backup safety device. It is not something that you should rely on as your plan A. This is meant to be a backup. Like any piece of equipment, it can fail, so it shouldn't be something that you rely on. It is just a safety device, a backup device. If you look at the literature for all of the AADs, they all spell this out in excruciating detail. Also, I strive for your accuracy, but I am a human being and therefore capable of making mistakes. If you find that anything I say in this video is inaccurate or incorrect, please let me know either privately or in the comments down below. And something else I want to make clear, I have not been paid by any of these vendors to be included in this video. I have not been paid by any of these vendors to exclude any other vendor to make this video. Generally speaking, I do not recommend one particular vendor over all others. There may be situations where I recommend, recommend a group of vendors or I might recommend against a particular vendor or group of vendors, but that, in my opinion, is in the best interest of the consumer and not because I've been paid or in any way. If I'm ever paid by a vendor to say anything, I will, of course, disclose that in the video, but in this video, there is no disclosure necessary because I've not been paid by any of these vendors. In fact, the vendors in this video don't even know that I'm making this video. So in this video, we're going to talk about everything that you need to know to make an informed decision for your next AAD purchase. We're going to talk about the different vendors that are available. We're going to talk about the AAD lifespans. They all have limits in terms of lifespan. We're going to talk about maintenance requirements or inspection requirements for them. Then most of them will have them. We're going to talk about service bulletins. We're going to talk about buying a new AED versus buying a used AED. And then we're going to talk about some AED vendors to avoid. So first off, why an AED? So before we even get started, let's talk about why you need an AED. Well, because you're worth it. Because I'm worth it. There are thousands of recorded saves from the three vendors uh, over the years. If you skydive long enough, you're going to know people who have been saved by AEDs. It's just part of the nature of our, our, of our sport. So when, when I say a save, a save is where the AED activated and likely saved someone's life or at least prevented a more tragic outcome. So of the three primary vendors, uh, Vigil has recorded 351 saves on their website. Cypress has over 4,000 saves. And I know that the Mars M2 has some saves as well, but I couldn't find any information on their website. Uh, but I do know that they've had saves as well. So why would you need an AAD? Well, hopefully you never need one. I've done 1,600 skydives and have never needed an AAD. I know people that have done over 10,000 skydives and they've never needed an AAD. But it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So why would you need an AAD? Well, some of the, sometimes some of the skydives we can do, we can end up colliding. We could have uh, skydiver and skydiver collisions. A skydiver could collide with a part of the airplane on exit and knock them unconscious. A collision with another skydiver can knock us unconscious. There could be a medical issue where you're knocked unconscious and, you're not, and you can't deploy. There could even be a loss of altitude awareness, which is something that should never happen to you, but you know what, sometimes shit happens. Shit happens. And another reason is your, your drop zone will probably require that you have an AED. And it's well within their rights because it's their airplanes, their property, their drop zone. 
their business, it's well within the rights to require that you have one to get on their airplanes. And me personally, I have two rigs. I might be building a third rig. They all have AADs. They will always all have AADs. So I've convinced you that you need an AAD, so now what? Let's talk about what you need to know to make an informed decision. First off, let's talk about the anatomy real quick just to make you familiar with what the components are. So the three primary components of any AAD, regardless of manufacturer, are the control unit, which you're probably familiar with, and there's the processing unit, and then there's the cutter. So the control unit is how you interact with the AD, turn it on, turn it off, look at some warning messages, look at some informational messages or some logs or some, uh, or some statistics, or in some of them, that's how you do your inspection. Then we have the processing unit, and that's what handles, that's, what, that's where the sensor is, the barometric sensor. And that's how it determines how fast you're falling and at what altitude you are, plus some other logic in there. And then we have the cutter, and that's what actually does the cutting of the reserve closing loop in case it activates. So let's get to the AADs themselves. There are three manufacturers of AADs for the sport civilian skydiving market. The number of manufacturers is three, and three is the number of manufacturers. If it's not one of these three, don't jump it. There's a couple of older manufacturers that no longer make civilian AADs. I would not jump them under any circumstance. I would not buy them. You can still find a few of them on the market every now and then. I, I don't run into them very often, but you might see one, uh, one of the boards or one of these classified Facebook groups or whatever. Don't buy them. It's got to be one of these three. So the names of the companies are a little bit different than maybe the name of the product. For example, the maker of the Cypress 2 is a company called AirTech out of Germany. AirTech GmbH. Vigil, that company is called AAD, which is a little bit confusing, but we just refer to them as Vigil. And they're based out of Belgium. And then the M2 is made by a company called Mars, and they're based out of the Czech Republic. So these are all European manufacturers. And they're all acceptable as AADs in the United States and just about every other country I know of. I don't know of any countries that doesn't allow any of these to be jumped. If you do know a country, do let me know down in the comments, but I don't think there are any. So when you're purchasing an AAD, there's a couple of things you probably want to keep in mind in, in, in making your decision. One is the lifespan. So all of the AADs that we're talking about have a limited lifespan, anywhere from 12 and a half years to 20 years, depending on the manufacturer and depending on the model. So they all have either maintenance or inspection requirements or recommendations, and you need to be familiar with those. Some of them need to be sent back in to be inspected or have components replaced. Some of them it may, it may be recommended, and some of them don't have any throughout their lifespan, but they may need to be inspected by rigor during the repack. They all cost roughly the same. The cheapest is the Mars M2, which is uh, $999 US dollars retail. The most expensive is the Cypress 2 at $1,200. The Vigil is slightly less expensive than, than the Cypress 2, and that's, I think it's $1,199. So just a hair cheaper than the Cypress. Because these components are hidden and their value is not determined by their color or other cosmetics, they're pretty easy to price in terms of how they're used. You just do a prorated formula on the lifespan left on the, on the device. And then you factor in any maintenance requirements and what it might cost to send it in to get components replaced or the price of those components. And you can come up with a pretty standard figure for what an AD is worth. In fact, there's some calculators you can use. So if you want to pick up a less expensive AD, you can pick up a used one with a, lim with a more limited lifespan, and those are pretty good deals typically. However, they tend to go pretty fast, um, so you may not be able to find one on the used market. And then finally, any, any AD or any critical skydiving component is susceptible to service bulletins. Certainly, uh, Vigil and Cypress both have had service bulletins for the various models that they have, and I think Mars M2 has some too. Check to see if a used AD that you're going to buy is, has an applicable service bulletin on it, or um, and then check with the service bulletins through the life of your AD to make sure that you don't need to send it in or take any other corrective action. So which AD is best? This is a question I often get as a rigger um, and as an instructor, and I know a lot of riggers and instructors will get this question. And I'm going to steal an answer from one of my mentors, Ted Farnsworth. He's a master rigger here in Oregon, and his answer to when someone asks, which AD should I get? His answer is, just get one. It's far better to have any of the three AADs than it is to not have one, period. So uh, just get one of them. I can't tell you which of these three is the best. Generally speaking, they're all trusted in the market. They're all likely to save you if you need saving. But again, they all are physical components and physical components are not perfect, they can fail. It's better to have them and than to not have them. Certain people have opinions on, well, I prefer this or I won't jump with that. Um, typically based on fairly anecdotal evidence, not to say that their experiences aren't valid, 
But generally speaking, one person's experience may color their opinion of a particular vendor. I've had a couple of experiences that might color my particular opinion, but generally speaking, any of these three are gonna be good AADs to have. So of the three manufacturers, we have Vigil. Uh, the company's called AAD, but uh, they sell the Vigil. There's the Vigil 2, the Vigil 2 Plus, and the Vigil Quattro. So the Vigil 2, 2 Plus, and Quattro have a lifespan of 20 years. So the Vigils used to not have any maintenance requirement at all, other than that their batteries lasted 10 or 12 years, depending on when they were manufactured. But the, and it used to be something you could just order a battery and then your rigger could do the replacement. However, riggers can't do the replacement locally anymore. The entire unit needs to be sent in when the battery is expired to be replaced. And the battery will expire in either 10 years or 12 years, depending on when the battery was replaced or when the, when the unit was made. So it's October 2018, that's the cutoff. So starting October of 2018 and beyond, the batteries last for 12 years. Anything made before that, it, the batteries last only 10 years. And what that, that extra two years buys you is a little bit of wiggle room when you're gonna get that battery replaced because it doesn't actually extend the overall lifespan of the unit. That means I've got two years that I can send my Vigil in to get its battery replaced instead of um, I need to do it within six months of the expiration date. And then after 20 years, all Vigils are no longer airworthy. There are perhaps a few Vigil ones that are still airworthy that have had batteries that have been replaced. The problem with the Vigil ones is that particular battery is no longer available. They cannot be replaced. So even if the Vigil one is not 20 years old, it is either not airworthy anymore because the battery has expired or the battery is pretty close to expiring. So the only thing you can do at this point is Vigil has a replacement program. There's two different conflicting pieces of information on their website in May of 2020 when in this video was recorded. One piece of information says you can send it in and get a prorated discount depending on how much life you had left on your Vigil 1. And the other one says if you send in a Vigil 1 that still has life left on it, they will sell you a Quattro, which has 20 years on it, for 600 US dollars. So I don't know which one is which. I would check with Vigil before making any of these decisions or you know counting on one or the other. But I believe it's the $600 one. So if you still have a Vigil 1 that has life left in it, maybe the battery's expired or about to be expired, but the Vigil 1 still has life left in it. The last ones were made in about 2006, I think, so there should be some that have uh, several years left on them. $600, so the Vigil 1 plus $600 would get you a new Vigil Quattro, I think. So check with them first. And Vigil, if you're listening to this, I would you know, make some sort of note on your website. It's a little confusing. So we've got the Cypress 2 from AirTech. That's the current model. You can either get the specific mode models, such as the expert mode, which is what most licensed skydivers will get. Even if you've only got 26 jumps and you've just got an A license, you've still got the A license on your forehead, you still want the expert mode. Um, the student modes are for students, the firing altitudes are higher, and the activation speeds are lower, so you don't want the student modes as a licensed skydiver. They've got a speed mode if you're doing high performance canopy flying. They've got a student mode, which is of course just for AFF or coaching students. And then they've got a tandem mode for tandems. It's dangerous to jump uh, an inappropriate mode because the firing altitudes would be different. So make sure you're jumping the correct mode or the correct AED model that's appropriate for you. Cypress also sells a Cypress 2 C mode or changeable mode. And you can actually change between the speed mode, the expert mode, the student mode, or the tandem mode. These are especially useful for drop zones who have a fleet of rigs, either tandem rigs, student rigs, or rental rigs, and they want to be able to cycle their ADs through them as maybe some need to be sent in or for a service or whatever. So drop zones in particular like this mode. If you're a regular skydiver, the changeable mode may or may not be beneficial to you. Maybe you might be doing high performance canopy flying down the road. And I, when, I'm, when I mean high performance, I mean you're really going fast under these, under these canopies. So it, you may or may not want the, the changeable mode. Nowadays, a lot of the manufacturers just sell changeable modes, so it doesn't hurt you to get a changeable mode. So keep that in mind. They also have a wingsuit specific model, which is a little bit different, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So the Cypress 2 lifespans are a little bit confusing. Cypress 2s that were manufactured, that have a date of manufacture 2016 or prior. So anything made in the year 2016 or, or years prior to that have a 12 and a half year lifespan. Everything's made starting January of 2017 and after have a lifespan of 15 and a half years. So the newer ones will last longer. Any Cypress 2 manufactured in the year 2015 or prior 
have required maintenance at the four year mark and the eight year mark plus or minus six months, and that's non-optional. Anything made in the year 2016 or after do have a recommended maintenance cycle, but it's not required. If it's the 12 and a half year model, it's at the four year and eight year mark. If it's the 15 and a half lifespan version, then it's at the five year and 10 year mark. And again, it's only recommended if the, if the AD has been manufactured in January of 2016 or later. Cypress ones, there are no more Cypress ones on, out there that are still airworthy. They've all expired. They've all long since expired. Don't buy one unless you want. Um, sometimes you, someone will give you one. Some of the vendors will offer some rebates or deals if you, if you send in your old AD, even an expired one, and they'll give you like 50 bucks off or something like that, depending on their deals, the, depending on the deal that they have going on. So check with the different manufacturers. So if someone can give you one for free or like 10 bucks, it may or may not be worth it. It also, sometimes it's good to have as a, as a training tool, as a teaching tool, where I teach in Skydive Oregon, we have an old Cypress one that we use just to show you what they look like. So Mars has the M2 or the M2 Multi. They used to just sell the M2 and they would sell them in different modes. Like um, they would sell them in a mode that were regular skydivers. They had a tandem mode, they had a student mode, they had a canopy piloting mode. And now they just sell the Multi. So you might find the, the first mode on the market or the first one on the market. But now they just sell the Multi, the Multi mode um, AD. Um, either of them are fine if you're going to be, as long as you get the right mode, if you get the specific mode. And they are either 15 and a half years for lifespan or 15,000 skydives, whichever comes first. And 15,000 skydive, that's really going to be hard to do. So that means you're doing about 1,000 skydives a year, which is quite a bit. And to do 1,000 skydives a year for 15 years is pretty, not many people do that. There are probably some, but not many people do that. They have no maintenance cycle, so that you don't have to send it in, unless, of course, it, it fails one of their, their power on tests. So all the ADs do their self-test when you power them on. And of course, if it fails the test, then you have to send it in. Um, but Mars doesn't have a specific requirement that you send them in, in under normal operations. But every year, your rigger will probably, your rigger should do this um, once a year. Is It just does a couple of, they just do a quick inspection, check to make sure that the barometric pressure sensor is recording correctly and so forth. So the Mars probably has the easiest life cycles, but it is also the newest in the civilian market. They've been making military ADs for years, but they, they're a little bit more recent in the civilian market. Most ADs have a single cutter. In fact, the Mars M2 does not have a two cutter version. There are some rigs that require two cutters, some of the tandem rigs and the racer from the Jump Shack, or not, actually now they're called Parachute Labs, is also a two cutter rig. So you have to have a two cutter AED or you have to have a two cutter cutter connected to your AED. For Vigil and Cyprus, you either get one cutter or two cutter. If you're not sure, you probably just need one cutter, but you can check with your rigger to make sure. Most of the time, it's just one cutter. It's only the racer from Jump Shack and maybe one or two really rare rigs in the, in the sport jumper. So not tandem, but the sport jumper rigs um, that might re require two cutters. But most of the major manufacturers that are common today just require one cutter. If you have a two cutter AED, you can put it into a single cutter rig, no problem. If you have a two cutter rig and you have a single cutter AED, then you either then you need to get the two cutter cutter and you might need to pay a little bit of extra money to get that. And again, Mars M2, as far as I can tell, does not offer a two cutter version of their other AED, but Cypress and Vigil do. Most of the AEDs now sell a multi-mode AED. So for example, the Vigil just sells the Quattro and the Quattro has the four interchangeable modes. Mars M2 Multi, that has the four interchangeable modes. Cypress, you can either buy the specific modes, such as the expert mode or tandem mode or student mode, or you buy the C mode or changeable mode, which, which can switch between the four. As a sport jumper, you either want the, the, the regular mode, the sport jumper mode, typically called expert or pro. Um, you may want the speed mode down the road if you decide you want to do some high performance canopy flying. So here's a matrix of the different modes that the three manufacturers have for their changeable mode AADs. So we have the student mode and that's universal across all of them. They just call, calls them the student mode. The firing altitude is higher and the activation speed is lower. So it's a little bit more sensitive. The Mars M2 actually has two student modes. One's called student and one's called intermediate. Now, don't let intermediate fool you. It is not for a licensed skydiver who's just starting out. It is for a student skydiver who is maybe more advanced in their AFF training or maybe into coaching. It's up to the instructor to decide whether or not they should have the student jump in student mode or intermediate mode if they're jumping a student rig. 
So, but the intermediate mode is not for a licensed skydiver. It is just for a student skydiver. Then we have the what was what would be appropriate for most skydivers. It's either called the expert mode or the pro mode. Then we have the tandem mode, which is universal across all of them, and those firing altitudes are higher because the tandem pole altitudes are higher. In fact, uh, in 2020, the USPA has raised the deployment altitude for tandems. For a regular licensed skydiver, you want the expert or pro mode, depending on what they call it. I know it sounds weird to say, oh, I've got 26 jumps and I'm a pro but or an expert, but that's just what they call it. You don't want to jump the student mode. You don't want to jump the intermediate mode. You certainly don't want to jump the tandem mode because those firing altitudes and, and firing sensitivity and the, the speed uh, settings are going to be inappropriate for you as a licensed skydiver. And then they all have a sp speed mode or swooper mode, either call it the speed mode or the extreme mode or the canopy piloting mode and that's for when you're doing very high performance landings and when they start their turns they could they could crank out a turn at a, at a high enough altitude that the AD thinks you've gone into free fall again and then you've got a two out. Two outs are dangerous normally but if you're doing a high performance landing and all of a sudden you have your reserve come out that's even that's also very dangerous so uh, these speed modes are less sensitive they will accept a higher uh, descent rate which may be how they are building up, how the supers are building up speed. Most skydivers won't need this. If you're really doing some high performance canopy flying, talk to one of the high performance canopy coaches to find out when you should transition into a speed mode versus regular mode. So while all the manufacturers have changeable mode cypresses that correspond to those four settings, which are expert mode, which is for regular skydivers, tandem student, and swooper mode, Cypress is unique. They also sell a wingsuit specific AAD. This is a little bit different than the others because it has two sensitivity settings. So one of the challenges with wingsuits, especially the really large ones, the ones you fly when you've got a lot of experience. So with uh, canopy flying, as you get more experience, then you can shrink your canopy size uh, over time. With wingsuit flying, it's the opposite. You increase the wingsuit size as you get more skill. And when the wingsuits get bigger, your descent rate may be too slow to trigger your AAD. So the wingsuit mode is more sensitive for the wingsuit flight portion of your skydive. It then will switch to a less sensitive mode so that if, um, if you're gonna do a faster turn on your canopy, it's not going to set that off there. So it actually switches between sensitivities depending on what mode of flight you're in. Either you're flying your wingsuit or you're flying your canopy. It has a special audible um, thing that tells you that it switched from wingsuit mode or free fall mode into canopy mode. And that's a requirement to use it to have that thing in there. It's a little bit more complicated of uh, operation, but if you're flying the really large wingsuits, it's maybe a good option to have. It is more expensive than the other AADs. It's about $300 more. So I think this one's about $1,500 total US dollars retail. I wouldn't say that you need it to do wingsuiting. Certainly any of the vendors have AADs that are appropriate for you as a wingsuit pilot. However, once you get to the really big wingsuits, this may be a good option to have. But I wouldn't ask me. I would ask a wingsuit coach or a wingsuit flyer who's got a lot of experience. My experience with wingsuiting is limited and I'm not a wingsuit coach so I couldn't give you a good answer on that one. So if you're curious talk to your wingsuit coach, talk to your wingsuit instructors, talk to or even talk to the manufacturers whether or not it's appropriate to have this specific wingsuit AAD. Again it is more expensive. It's not required for probably most of the wingsuits out there but certainly the bigger ones it might be a good idea to have. And you can do normal jumps in it so it's not something that you have to only do wingsuiting with. Uh, the manufacturer does say that you can do regular jumps. So maintenance costs are something that you should keep in mind when you purchase an AAD. AD. What's it going to cost? It's either it's it's at least going to cost you shipping to send to send your AD back to get the battery replaced or get it inspected or whatever, and they probably have a service cost as well. Uh, and every each one of the manufacturers will have a specific cost, and it will depend on where you live. Most of them will have a place in the United States where you can send them to. Most of them will, of course, have a place in their local country where they're made where you can send it to. If you live somewhere like Australia or China. Uh, I don't know what the cost would be to ship it or have them have them take care of it. So you, know, you do your own research in that regard. I, I can't answer that for you. Also keep in mind the cost of having your rig out of service because you don't have an AD in it. I wouldn't jump into a rig without an AD and most places won't let you do that either. So you're not going to be able to do jumps in your rig while that AD is being sent in. Typically it takes a couple of weeks for it to get sent back and then your rigger will have to do a repack to uh, reinstall it. Most of the time it's a good idea to keep a keep a track of when your maintenance cycle is coming up so that way you can schedule your maintenance during whatever season downtime you may have. 
Here in Oregon, we typically don't jump much in the winter, not because it's too cold, it's just we don't see the sun for like six months. So in the winter in Oregon or in the winter in a lot of places in the Northern Hemisphere is a good time to have your AD serviced if it needs it. Service bulletins, any critical component of a skydiving gear, such as reserves, mains, containers, potentially will have service bulletins. And these are just things that are, you know, issues that have come up and may need to be addressed. They either need to be inspected, sent back in, or some other type of corrective action that maybe your local rigger can do. Sometimes it's a warning saying, hey, our AD will shut off after 14 hours, regardless of whether or not you've been jumping. So it actually, if you keep on jumping and jumping and jumping and it's been 14 hours, your AD just may turn off. Always check the user's guide for your AD to figure out if that's the case or not. It's good to keep up with your service bulletins. Now, your rigger, when they do the inspection and repack of your container, is probably going to check here the serial number of your AD and the model number to see if it has a current service bulletin to see if anything needs to happen. They may or may not, but either way, it's your gear, you're the one jumping it, so you should be proactive about it. Your data card on your every container in the United United States at least will have a data card and then on that data card will have the serial number and model number of your and manufacturer date of your AAD. So you can take that and go to the AAD manufacturer's website, plug in your serial number or check their service bulletins and you should be able to determine whether or not your AAD is susceptible to a specific service bulletin. So this video was made in May of 2020 and um, there is one big service bulletin for vigils that have a, that are manufactured in a certain time range that have a certain serial number or have a certain software version on them. They need to be updated they need to have their software updated because uh, they may turn off on a high altitude jump so make sure that your ad's are serviced there's no problem with buying a used ad so long as it as it's within the lifespan of that ad and it's been properly serviced or it's about to be serviced and you're going to send it in to get serviced they're pretty easy to price out in fact um, some websites will have guides on you punch in the, the the data manufacturer the ad the model number and it will give you a fair price for what it is so they're pretty easy to price out in terms of what's a fair price price. You know, sometimes selling a used canopy, figuring out what a fair price for them is a little bit tricky sometimes. Some of the factors are a little bit subjective, but AADs are pretty solid in terms of figuring out what a fair price is. There may be some market forces at, at work there. There may be higher demand or less demand, so that may affect your price a little bit. But generally speaking, AADs have a pretty consistent pricing range, depending on how much life they have left in their lifespan. So here's just a quick AD matrix, just to remind you. So there's three manufacturers. We have the Cypress 2, several different variations of them, either the, the changeable mode or the specific modes. We have the Vigil Quattro. You also have the Vigil 2 and 2 Plus on the used market. We have the R Mars M2 or the Mars M2 Multi. The Cypress 2 either has a lifespan of 12 and a half years or 15 and a half years, depending on when it was made. It has either a required maintenance cycle or a recommended maintenance cycle. And the new Cypress 2 will retail for 12 US dollars. So the Vigil Quattro is the current version that uh, the Vigil Company sells, or it's called AD, but we just called the Vigil Company. So, or you can get the Vigil 2 or 2 Plus on the used market as well. It has a, they all have a 20 year lifespan. They all have to have their battery replaced at either the 10 year mark or the 12 year mark, depending on when it was made. And they retail for 1190 US dollars. We have the Mars M2 or the Mars M2 Multi that has a lifespan of 15 and a half years or 15,000 skydives, whichever comes first. They do not have any maintenance requirement, so you don't have to send it in unless of course it unless it fails one of their self-tests, but that's true for any of them. But it does need to be inspected every year by a rigger. So typically it will be done during your repack cycle. You probably just would have to pay a couple of extra bucks to have your rigger do it, or they might even just include it with their repack fee. So talk to your rigger to see what they charge for that. And that retails new for $999, making it the less expensive one of the bunch. Which one is best? That's up to you to decide. I can't tell you which one of these is gonna be best. So AADs to avoid, there's a couple of AADs on the market. Or the, none of the current AD manufacturers are AADs to avoid, but you may find a couple on the used market. Uh, for example, Argus, you may find a few of these. I've actually seen one of these Arguses and um, they are, their batteries need to be replaced every year. I don't believe the Argus actually has a lifespan on it, so you still might see them on the used market. Um, their batteries are replaced every year. They're basically um, camera batteries. You can't find them at every drugstore or grocery store, but you, they're not too hard to find. You can get, get them off of Amazon pretty easily. The, the one, two, three batteries. I, I still wouldn't jump them. Some rigs prohibit the, ins the installation of them. They had a couple of misfires a couple of years ago and um, some manufacturers, for example, Sunpath, they make it the, the Javelin. 
I believe it's them and some others that have specifically prohibited Argus's from being installed to them. So if you're under any sort of jurisdiction where you need to follow manufacturer instructions, we are not, it's not lawful for us to install or maintain an Argus in a Javelin. So I would not buy an Argus on the used market. I would not jump an Argus on the used market. There's a couple other really weird ones on the market that I've seen come up now and then. If it's not the Cypress 2, if it's not the Vigil 2, 2 Plus, or Quattro, if it's not the Mars M2, I just wouldn't buy it, period. And there's some really, really old mechanical AEDs. So all the current AEDs that we use today are electronic. So they have electronic sensors, digital sensors, etc. But a long time ago, they used to have these mechanical ones. And they were so unreliable, they were so prone to firing at any altitude that people would not jump with someone who was jumping with a mechanical AED. You're very, very unlikely to ever even see one unless you're in a museum. Actually, the only time I've ever seen one was at the PIA symposium. And they had a little museum piece. They had a little museum exhibit, and I actually got to see one of these old AEDs these old mechanical AEDs. You're not likely to come in contact with one, but again, the rule is if it's not one of those three manufacturers that we talked about in this video, don't buy it. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know down below in the comments section, or if you think that anything that I've said is inaccurate. Um, I'm gonna be producing more and more of these videos as, we go, as time goes on. I'm gonna have a series on gear, a series on safety issues, and a series on training. So hope you enjoy this video and I hope you enjoy my other videos and uh, thank you for watching. Again, my name is Tony Burke.